Okay. Good morning and welcome to day five of Textilers Cohort 4 um, program. And this is the security learning pathway. Um, we are looking at the Microsoft Identity and Access Administrator um, course, the SC300. And if you're just joining us today for the first time via YouTube, um, you're welcome. Please do well to look at day one up until day four to be able to catch up with us what we're doing today on day five. Um, my name is Joy Emedom, I'm a textilers mentor. Um, I'm also the head of communications in textilers. Um, I'm a security consultant and I have over 13 years doing technology services. However, I have about seven years doing identity and access management. Um, so we've been looking at the Microsoft Azure, Azure AD identity you know, provider. An identity provider is something that helps you to be able to manage you know, your identity, um, put controls, um, authorize, assign access controls. However, there are different identity providers. And so for this cohort, we're looking at the Microsoft Azure AD, which is an identity provider. And we looked at, in order to provide identity and access, you know, management and security, there are key, three key zero trust methodologies you want to apply, which is, you know, um, verify explicitly. Um, another one is least privilege, and somebody else helped me with the third one. <laughs> verify explicitly, least privilege, and I'll wait for somebody in the class who has been joining us from day one to remind me of what the third one is. Now, assume you bridge. Assume, bridge. assume bridge. Exactly, assume bridge. And you might wonder why, why do we even have to assume bridge? Because you don't want to also assume that it's not a bridge and then it's a bridge. So for every time we see an anomaly or we see something that is frequent and unusual, we want to assume a possible bridge has happened and then be able to analyze and react and then let it be that is a false positive rather than stay and say it's normal. Um, if you look at the history of several hacks that have happened, you will find out that most times for people who their MFA, you know, were, were um, circumvented, it's most times around, they will see multiple prompts of MFA. They know that they are not triggering any MFA transaction and they are okay with it. And it's not creating curiosity in their mind. In identity protection, we need to have that curiosity that says, why am I getting tokens? I'm not trying to log into any of my portal. Why am I receiving a um, request to put my MFA token? Okay. And so you at that point, you're going to assume that somebody has breached you or is about to um, breach you. Also, you don't want to just say, oh, everybody needs access, especially if you're in an environment where you have third party um, and vendors, you don't want to just assume that everybody needs access into the network. You need to understand why do they need access, you know? And so even if they need access, what type of access do they need? Oh, everybody in HR needs to be able to access the HR application accurate, but does everybody in HR need to be a HR administrator on the HR application? No, because even in the HR department, you have segregation of duties. There are people in payroll, there are people in benefits, there are people in learning and development, there are people in onboarding. So if you had to give everybody the same level of privilege, what will happen is that you will not be able to control what people do. But if you do segregation of duties, which we call this privilege, you give people only what they need. That way you'll be able to control people's identity and what they see and where they go and the impact of change they have. So that in the event where there's a breach, you can contain where that breach you know, has happened. And then the same thing with verify explicitly. Why would you assume that the identity that you are seeing is the identity that is requesting access? And so we've seen how to use multi-factor authentication as a second level authentication to verify that the person who is requesting for access, the username and password that I'm seeing and I have approved is the same person who is putting the token to validate that they want this. So even in your normal banking transactions, you initiate a transfer, it's your, application, it's your account, you've logged in, you've initiated a transfer, what do you do? You're asked to provide a transfer token, right? To further verify that you are sure that it is you 
that wants to initiate this transaction. So in order for us to do identity and access management and security, there's always that need to verify explicitly. So we've looked at that all the way up until last week. And so today we want to look at a very powerful tool that Microsoft has, which it calls the Azure AD Identity Protection. So the Azure, um, Azure AD Identity Protection helps us to secure the Microsoft Azure AD. The identity protection, you know, it's a Microsoft service that enables organizations to view their security posture. So remember, we have said that the Microsoft Azure AD is Microsoft's own cloud identity provider. We've also said that companies who had their own on-prem data centers, and when we use this terminology on-prem, what we meant is companies that had maybe a dedicated building or they were co-locating somewhere with their own servers and built their own identity system. Okay, those companies were able to leverage on the tools or security services on the Microsoft Azure using what we call the AD Connect to do federation. So the identity protection on Microsoft Azure helps you to be able to, you know, view your security posture. What's your security posture? It can tell you, oh, you have X number of accounts and this X number of accounts, five out of them have weak passwords, two out of them you know, assigning in with malicious IP addresses. Seven out of them are signing in from critical um, or red flag locations. Those form of analysis that you normally would not be able to see because once you have created identities for your users, you have sent them across, right? You, your users are now using these identities to assess your resources. How do you know? A bridge does not just happen in one day. It's a function of different layers of activities. So how are you able to ensure that you have foresight or insight rather into what this identity is doing? So the Microsoft Identity Protection Service will now allow you as an organization to see where your security posture is. You can be able to see that, oh, we're not doing very well. We have 50 accounts and we have enforced micro um, multi-factor authentication. authentication. However, only 20 of those accounts have implemented it, right? 30 of them are still bypassing. So if you remember when you were setting up your lab, if you see that there was a place that was forcing us to do MFA, but we kept saying, ask me later. So the identity protection can give you those insights and analysis that lets you know that XYZ number of people have not set up their MFA and then you can now move it to enforce because probably you just enabled it and you didn't enforce or you can now move to where you revoke user sessions and then enforce them to log in and do that MFA. Um, it can also show you, you know, where detections are happening. You know, it can also help you even to automate detections and remediation so that in the case where, so it's not just telling you where your security posture is, how does that help? It can say, these are the kind of security um, issues that you have and I can help you fix it. So for instance, if, the, if it is flagging that we can see that you have three users, you know, signing in from with malicious um, IP addresses. You can now put a trigger that says, you can now automate a detection and response policy that says that anytime you see, you know, accounts with malicious IP login, block, deny, revoke sessions. So that way you don't have to be the one who manually comes all the time to be looking at security postures 24 seven. So imagine if the incident is going to happen at midnight and you're sleeping, right? because you have configured this automation, automated detection and response action, it can help you to be able to curb those um, potential security threats to your organization. It can also help you to investigate risk in the sense that once you click on that detection, you can actually see the fingerprints, you can actually see the thread. Okay, this is where it's happening. This IP is coming from this device. This malicious IP is coming from this country. This malicious IP is tied to this user. It can give you that in-depth you know, investigation. And then you can also export this risk into third party. So um, organization, organizations that have um, uh, system event investigation management, so a SIM solution that is not Microsoft SIM solution, they can actually take this um, event and export it into their SIM solutions that give them a dashboard in their SOC centers. Any question? So what are the common, yeah, what are the common risk detections that we see with identity and remediation options and investigations that we can do. So common risks that we detect 
and remediate with an identity with Microsoft Identity Protection is anonymous IP, right? So somebody is logging with an anonymous IP. Why? You know, so if you if you watch some of these um, ethical hacking videos, you will see that one of the ways that the hackers do is that they masquerade their IP address. So just go into your, your browser now and put what is my IP on, a, on, your, on your Google browser. It will tell you what your IP address is. So our ability to be able to connect on the internet is through our IP addresses. And every IP address is assigned to an ISP, right? And the ISP either has that IP address as a dedicated IP address for an organization or an IP address that is dedicated to itself, but it has leased it out to an organization. So what you have most corporate organizations do is they buy a block of IP addresses that is dedicated to them, right? From the international body that does IP addresses. So their ISP providers have those IP address block as their internet IS, um, IP addresses. But small organizations that can't do that kind of investment when they connect to their ISP, which is their internet service providers, they request for dedicated IPs that is still owned and registered by the ISP, but the ISP can trace it that, oh, I assigned this IP address to Joy and Joy Sons Limited. So everything that you do today on the internet is linked to an IP address. So how are the hackers able to disguise? What they do is they use different tools to masquerade the IP address and the IP address becomes an anonymous IP. So the moment you see those kind of triggers on your detection solutions, you want to be curious because why, if you like, if you're legitimate on the internet and you're doing legitimate services, why do you want your IP address to be anonymous? So those kind of things, that's where assume bridge comes in. We don't just assume that eh, maybe our staffs are using VPN. Maybe no. What if that's not a staff? So when we see things like anonymous IP, which is a typical IP and typical travel, we want to you know detect those kind of. Um, identity threats, and we want to remediate and investigate them. Malware linked IP addresses, like I said, because IP addresses are owned over time, okay, over the internet, the intelligence studies IP addresses, and you can be seen, oh, these IP addresses are known to be used by um, spammers, to be used by hackers. And so those IP addresses are flagged in the IP address database. And so companies, the identity protection service goes into those database and takes those feeders. So once it sees that somebody is actually connecting to us from malicious flag IP addresses, again, we want to assume bridge. You don't just want to assume is a fluke. So the identity protection can help us trace those kind of triggers and or rather, rather those kind of um, identity risk. Unfamiliar signing properties. Out of the blues, you are seeing a signing property that is not matching you know, your organization condition. Why, why, are you, why are you doing that? Maybe um, users, users first login into the domain can either be from mobile OS, Mac OS, or Windows OS, right? And then the next thing you're seeing, the first login into the corporate domain for user is maybe from a Linux device. Or you'll be curious. So unfamiliar signing properties, the identity protection can trigger it, you know, those detections for you to be able to to remediate. Also, there's a global database, right? Um, I'll look for the IP address and the website and send to you. You can just put your email address down to tell you if your email address password has ever been compromised, right? So I used to use Canvas a lot and there was a time, because um, I'm a certified ethical hacker, so I used to do a couple of play around with, with stuff. And then I, I went to that who's pawned and put, and I found out that my Canvas a, a, um, password, and I think a couple of applications had been compromised, you know, and then I had to go and go and go and change them. So you can know credentials that have been leaked, you know, um, because the identity protection knows how to go into that, that portal and fit, take out the database and match across the passwords in your organization and be able to see that you have users that are using passwords that are now in the password database. Because for instance, when hackers want to try, it's, first of all, the first thing we do, it's not like we know your passwords in our head. We have a database that we take and then we run, because it's automated, it runs that your account through that database first. And if your account matches any of the passwords, they don't have to bother trying to decrypt it, just um, logs in for them. So those leaked credential databases, the identity protection goes there 
and pulls out the data and feeds you across. Even from your normal browser, if you go to, if you're the person, if you're the type of person that saves your password on your browser, if you go to your browser settings, you will see passwords that you have saved and it will tell you passwords that you have that are weak, strong, you know, and have been leaked. It's there, it's on Google, you can see it. If you go to your settings, passwords, you can see, see that there. You can see your credentials that, you know, for portals that you have that are leaked already. What it means by leaked is, doesn't necessarily mean it was you, but just means you're using a password that's already been flagged on the database of possible Greek passwords. So it means that if somebody for any reason wants to compromise you, it's going to be easy because you're using a password in your system that's already in the database as a flagged password. You know, and then you have things like password spray, you have things like Azure AD threat intelligence, you have things like new country. Like I said, if your business does not have anything to do in certain countries and all of a sudden you begin to see user logging from those countries, you want to be triggered, you want to assume bridge, you don't just want to assume, oh, maybe a staff went for vacation there. No, right? You want to trigger those kind of alerts and then remediate. Um, when you see suspicious things like people forwarding emails from their inbox that they shouldn't. So the identity protection service on the Microsoft Azure AD can give you this in-depth risk detections and also help you remediate them. You know, it can also help you to investigate things like risky users, risky signings, risky, risky detections, you know, and then do some form of classification for you. So it can say, oh, even though this is a risky user, right, but it's low. And um, this is a risky user that is high, you know, each of these levels, it can represent the likelihood, you know, of that user being compromised so that also you can prioritize your remediation and, and maximize your resources. Again, like I always say, licensing, licensing, licensing. When you come to the real world and you start to provide a service for clients, it's also very important, you know, to understand that some of these licenses are not out of the box. You require certain level of uh, licensing features to be able to use them, okay? But, you know, these are things just to note. Um, when you move into reality, you would, it's things that you will factor in while you're making your proposal to your client. So identity protection has different permissions. You have the global administrator, you have the security administrator, you have the security operator, you have security reader. These are different Azure AD roles. Remember, we're going to look at Azure AD roles, how you assign full roles. But these are key um, four function security roles in Azure AD and what can they do? So we know that a global administrator is the um, alpha and omega of a tenant. That's why you have to be very careful about who is your global administrator and who has global administrator access. Anybody that is a global administrator is the alpha and omega of a tenant, can do any undo. So they don't have any limitation. The people who have security administrators, you know, automatically have full access to identity, identity protection, but um, security administrators cannot reset user password. A security operator can view all the identity protection reports, can also look at the, the dashboard, the blaze, can actually also uh, um, dismiss a user risk, confirm that it's safe. So when in the security posture is flagging this as low, medium, high, a, a security operator can say, okay, a security operator can say, okay, let me ignore, let me proceed, you know, um, but also again, a security operator is an operator. Security operator cannot configure policies. They can't change policies. They can't reset passwords. They can't configure alerts, but what they can do is operational activity. So they see triggers, they act on those triggers. You know, they take actions on those two levels. They cannot change the policies or the rules that govern or that make those triggers, you know, appear on the dashboard. A security reader, as the name applies, right, is having just reader only access. Um, a, a, an operator can initiate some operational tax, but a reader cannot even do anything. So in places where you have auditors, you know, people who are auditors, those are the kind of rules. So if you have somebody who is a security auditor who is coming to audit the tenant, it would be best to give them the security reader, you know, role. So they'll be able to view all the identity protections reports, you know, export this report, um, overview, but they cannot do any action like, um, configure, change, even give feedback on detections they cannot own, like a security operator or a security administrator. So let's look at how to implement and manage user risk. Okay, 
both signing risk policy and user risk policies can be enabled to automate the response to risk detections and to allow users to self remediate okay an organization must decide the level of risk that they are willing to accept you know so you want to balance user experience and you want to balance security posture so um the azure ad allows you to create these policies right that you know you can use to self remediate you know triggers but everything starts with first of all understanding what does the organization want some people will tell you multi-factor authentication is stressful <laughs> when people put their username and password they will now use their username and password they will now put another token it's in, when you meet those kind of organizations you need to put out what are the risk for them when they don't have mfa and then they have to accept those risks so most times if you're the one who is the security consultant don't take things on verbal have people you know give you sign-offs exceptional approvals people ask for waivers let all of that so that you are you are sure that you know you are covered you have recommended this but the client is saying no we don't want to stress our users we want when they come it's going to be easy for them okay but these policies can be configured and self-remediated okay We'll see that in our lab, how to configure these user risky policies and assign risk policy. Any questions so far? Welcome, um, Sui, you're welcome. What is MFA registration policy? We've talked about MFA over and over again. In fact, from day one up until day four last week, we kept talking about multi-factor authentication, the second level of authentication, what you know versus what you have and what you are, okay? Um, so the multi-factor authentication provides a means to verify you are using more than just a username and password. We can, we have said, you know, this consistently in the zero trust methodology, just, um, we verify explicitly. So just username and password is not enough for us to verify that you are the one trying to make this access or your device is trying to make this access or your application is trying to make this access. We always put a second layer of security, right? And so that second layer of security is the MFA, but the users must first register for the MFA to happen, okay? MFA does, doesn't happen out of that. You've enabled MFA will not just mean it will work. The users have to register for it, right? And the good thing is it would, it's what is going to help you deliver strong authentication and it will play a key role for when you are remediating. So the good thing with MFA is if you have some triggers, you can say that the MFA actually, sorry, the remediation action should be reinforced MFA. Because at that point, you know that the MFA is with the, the, the second factor authentication is with the person. So if the person's username and password has been compromised because your action, your remediation action is that reinforced MFA that um, automatically disconnects wherever that person has logged in and then now starts prompting for, for MFA. And at that point, it's expected that the user should be saying, I'm not triggering an MFA action. Why am I getting prompt for MFA? Or oh, it's possible that my account has been breached. So again, we'll look at the, um, the labs on, the, on how to create the MFA registration policy. We want to monitor, investigate, and remediate elevated risky users. So in the um, risky user signing, we, we, we have what we call the risky user reports, right? In the risky user reports, you would see a list of all detections. You will see the period by which those detections have happened. And you can customize that your report. Um, you can download it into a CSV. And um, that's where people like Madame Fraka come in, data guys, they can now help you. Maybe if an organizations that want their management to be seeing this dashboard, they can take these data sources so they can work with the identity people and say, these data sources pointed to a particular, sorry, these data exports point to a particular data source. And for them, they go there and they create dashboards, you know, that management can see and be able to get insights into without having to log into the Azure um, Active Directory to see this report. So if you have like a security um, team that you need to be reporting on security events, 
Now work hand in hand with your data power BI people to create dashboards that management can see and you can configure these reports to export and move into a particular data source that they feed into. But these reports are available. Um, example of risky user signings. You can see here, you know, how the dashboard is. You can see this user um, is talking about the state. It's talking about the risk level you know, and it's showing us when the risk was last updated, okay? So you can get insight into what your risk users, so you can see users that are at risk. Um, you can see users that are that are at risk, but with, you know, very medium. So they've already been remediated. The ones that are high and they've not been remediated. You can see all of that on the dashboard. Administrators have the options to remediate. They can self-remediate. What self-remediate? You can allow a user to self-remediate using the MFA or the single sign policy. So what do you do? You can create a policy that says, if a user becomes a risky user, so if there's a trigger that the user is now a risky user, the next action should be enforced MFA or the next action should be password reset, right? So you can, that's how you can self-remediate. It depends on what the organization wants. Um, there are also instances where you can say, if it triggers, you know, force the user to um, password to be reset. So at that point, the user cannot reset their password. They have to maybe call service decks. In some instances, maybe you say, if it is this kind of risk, because the organization has accepted those kind of risks, you can say, dismiss that user risk signing, right? And if you also see a particular set of individuals with risk detections, you can manually close it. So administrators can choose whatever means they want to use to remedy, depending on the maturity of the organization, depending on the resources that they have and what they agree is the best remediation process for them. Do not decide on your own, you know, for an organization. Always call out these things, let the organization agree and let these policies be signed off before you implement or before you start adopting. The Microsoft Graph APIs are also ways that we can use to collect reports, you know, and convert these reports into meaningful formats. Um, again, this is where we rely solely on the Power BI people. Now you have different workloads that are using your identity. You have different workloads that are using your identity. You have applications that are using your identity, right? And you want to even be sure that this is your identity. So for instance, we're using Gmail, most of our Gmail accounts now to assess the Microsoft, you know, um, portal, right? To assess the Microsoft development portal. Those are, are, are identities that are, the identity provider is not Microsoft, but because of federation, we have linked it together. So we have a tab under the risk detections that can show us, you know, workload detections. And you can be able to see, you know, these workload detections, um, the risk identities that have been performed on them. So it can flag that, oh, this is your Gmail account, you know, is risky, um, it's inside this location, it is, there's been a detection of it when it was logging into app A. So you can actually be able to trace it and know that, okay, this user is flagging risk a risk detection, but it's because the user account is being used on XYZ application. So it could be that that application itself has been compromised and it was from there that people's accounts were being harvested. So the, the identity, Microsoft Identity Protection can help you begin to do workload identity risk management. So you see the, um, there are different types of identity risk detections. You can look at threat intelligence, suspicious signing. Um, so when you do the Azure AD threat intelligence, it refers to that the risk detection has, you know, is consistent and you know, can see the pattern. So it helps you do things like threat intelligence. So it can say, I, why am I, we're always seeing this user. You know, there's a pattern of this user at six o'clock, always trying to log in from, Pakistan. It's not just that this user is risky user, but we can see that over time, 
between the hours of 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. is when this account is trying to do this thing. So it's not just that the account is trying to log in from Pakistan. It's always between this time. It can do deep level threat intelligence for you that enables you to see a pattern here. Because when hackers come, it's not the first day that they come into your environment that they're able to be successful. They can try today, they do not work, they go back. They take what they've been able to find out. Maybe they see some vulnerabilities. They go, they come back the next day. Maybe they're successful. Now, when they come in, they don't know where they are going. They don't know your organization, right? So when they come in, they're going to scan around, look for where they want to go in. They go out again. But <laughs> history has shown us continuously the hackers operate within a certain consistent time because that's when they find out that you are not watching them. That's when they've been able to prove that anytime they come into your environment by so time, they can get in and get out without anybody detecting them. So the threat intelligence helps us to be able to see those kind of patterns. We see consistent logging at a particular time. I've done an investigation for a bank where when we're doing investigation, we saw that the person was always coming in at between the hours of, of two to four in the morning and, and do what they need to do. And before um, people come in by six, it has thrown off the service. So it was, it was, it was, hijacking one of the legitimate services and it has prompted us. So when the application owner come in the morning, you know, trying to make sure that, oh, applications are working because the banking hall will open, they will see that that service is done and what they will do, they'll just restart. And the way it's been configured is that once you restart, the original service kicks back in and works. And so, but when they come in through the back door that they've already created, they shut down your own service and then they run with their back door service. But because during the day, they don't want you to see that, they shut down that your service so that when you come and you say, my service are not okay. Typical application administrators, what you see them is, please let me restart my server. As soon as they restarted the server, the original, the legitimate service starts and everybody is fine. And nobody is asking the question, why is, why every morning, why am I restarting server? It's not normal. So when I see people who are administrators and are okay with it, and that's how we used to do, once we restarted, everything will function. It used to amaze me, I'm like, but that's not how it should work. If you did it the first time and the second time, you should be curious as to why am I always restarting server and then it will work. What is making this server punk out that it's only when I restart it that the server works? You know, so the Azure AD Threat Intelligence can help you see those consistent patterns, you know, and flag them. Um, suspicious sign, unusual addition of credentials to an application. You know, so your applications that are doing um, OAuth authentications, it can see that, they've added more um, credentials to this um, application and it's a possible um, it's a possible compromise to the app, you know. Now we have what we call the Microsoft Defender for Identity. The Microsoft Defender for Identity takes us back to the on-prem that I told you. Now, because an organization has their Azure AD in their own data center, right? I already mentioned that it doesn't now mean that they cannot leverage on the Microsoft Azure Active Directory. So if they wanted to synchronize users to the cloud, even though their users were created on their on-prem, they will build the Azure AD Connect and do the federation. It's the same way if they wanted to leverage on the Microsoft Azure Identity Provide Protection, what they would do is to implement what we call the Microsoft Defender for Identity on their on-prem domain controllers, which is the Active Directory. And that will be able to take what is happening on their on-prem Active Directory and feed it into the Defender, the Microsoft Defender, right? Identity protection. And we'll be able to see all these things we've talked about on the dashboard. We'll be able to monitor users' activities. We'll be able to monitor user behavior. We'll be able to protect these user identities, check where their credentials are stored, because um, it's possible the users have used these credentials. Like I said, they have passwords that they're using that are that are already in leaked credential database. You can be able to provide all this clear incident information. So if you're an on-prem organization, doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot benefit from these good, wonderful features in the Microsoft um, identity protection. Now we've talked about, you know, how to, you know, um, when you assume breach, how do we assume breach? And that's by using the, the um, Azure Identity Protection, the MFA functionalities. Now, how do we, you know, ensure that you have the least privilege that you need? That's where roles, roles come into, into place. So um, you must always ask yourself, who needs access? 
you know, is it a user that needs access? Is it a group that needs access? Is it a service principal? Is it a managed identity? Who needs access to what? And what role do they need this access? Must they be owner of that role? Must they be contributor? Must they, um, or do they just need only user access? Or are there other specific tasks that they need to do, right? And what scope do we assign this to? So the Azure role-based access control is what helps you to, you know, manage access to Azure resources. You can assign roles to users, to groups, to service principal based on the scope that you have, okay? And, and that will be, will, that's us implementing the least privilege, you know, zero trust methodology. You can also do this from your Azure portal where you go to access control, pick up a user, you can create a custom role or you can assign an existing role. Best practice, best practice is whenever you go into the roles and you see, you see the existing roles, the default roles that Microsoft has provisioned, I always recommend people duplicate it and then customize it. So for instance, if you wanted to make people virtual and virtual um, machine administrators, don't just go to that default virtual machine administrator that Microsoft created there for you and start adding users. You have the ability to duplicate that role. Then when you duplicate, your own becomes a copy. Then you rename your own. So your own can now be uh, maybe Joy and Joy um, Limited virtual machine. And then because even in your organization, you might not just want one blank virtual machine administrator. Maybe people in server team should have one, people in the application team should have one, but customize it so that that default one that comes, Frank, I'm coming to you, I can see you, and that default one that comes, you can always know that nobody's assigned there. Again, reason, when, I miss, when hackers want to come, they go for anything default. So once you don't have any policy assigned to default rules, it helps make the the hacking process more difficult because the hacker now needs to find out which of your custom rules is referring to X, Y, Z because you're not using the default custom rules. Yes, Frank, can go ahead with your question. Um, could you explain that? Could you go back to that slide that has the identities and roles? Yeah, they are back. Um, can you explain that again, please? There's your are back. Okay. So RBAC means role-based access control. We are saying that we're going to use roles to control your access. Remember, one of the zero trust methodology is that we must provide least privilege. Privileges, what are the powers? What are the access rights that your identity has? Right. So if I make you a global administrator, if I create your account, franca.ibuzo at um, Joy Limited, and I take Franca at Buzo and put inside a group called Global Administrator, what that means is that Franca can do everything on the tenant. Now, maybe Franca doesn't know that that's what I've given you. Maybe all Franca was asking is that I want to be able to create users. Okay. I've joined the identity team. Please, I want to be able to create users. I want to be able to add users to groups. And I went and I put Franca in global administrator group. Franca tries to create users and she's successful. Franca will tell me thank you. But what Franca doesn't know is that she now also has the ability to create virtual machines. Meanwhile, all she wanted was users. She also now has the ability to delete a server. She now also has the ability to install an application. But she doesn't know because she's an identity team and she was very specific in her request. But the person who implemented it gave her a role that was beyond what she needed. So first of all, we use roles to assign access to users or to identities rather because it doesn't necessarily have to be a user. And those roles can, is what enables that identity to be able to do X, Y, Z on the environment. So it's very important that you might understand what people need to do. So back again to me using TT as an example. She's going to install CCTV. She sits down with the CSO to say, who and who needs to be able to do what on the CCTV? I have installed CCTV. She looks at her screen, it's recording. Typically that's what they do, the CCTV operators, as far as they are concerned, it's recording and they're gone, they get the sign of, they get paid. What they and then they give a username and password to the security team. That username and password they give to the security team. Security has three people in morning shift. 
two people in night shift. The five of them are using admin admin to log in. What happens is that the people in night shift become compromised staff. They probably work together with a with arm robbers and agree for them to come in. So they go in, shut down camera A. Those arm robbers are able to come in, finish what they do, and go. And when investigation starts, they say camera A has not been working. Ah, uh, how did you when? Oh, we don't know we're working on it. And when they look at the logs, the logs is showing admin, admin. Who is admin? Everybody's admin. So we, if we want to use role-based access control in that scenario, who can tell me what's the first thing we are supposed to do using role-based access control? What is the first thing we want to do in that scenario for a security control room? People should not fall my hand. <laughs> okay, not everybody should have uh, the same access. You should have like a, a global access, like somebody that can, um, you have, like you have the identities. The that is different the access anyway. Segregation of duties. That's the first thing you should do. The first thing you want to do is sit down with the CSO and say, can I have the segregation of duty? CSO too might have never thought about it. So you sit with him as an identity and access administrator to discuss the segregation of duty. Sir, in your security team, you have you have 10 security personnel assigned to Joy's company, Joy and Joy Limited. These 10 security personnel, inclusive of yourself, 10, what are their roles? Joy is the CS, um, um, Franca is the CSO, good. Miriam is the supervisor. Titi and Sui, they are all security officers that have different ships. So that is us understanding. So it means that when we come to the CCTV camera infrastructure, the security officers only just need to be able to view cameras, right? They should be able to look at the screen and see all the cameras and view. So for instance, if you look at what role to assign here, you see things like reader. So those kind of people are called readers. They don't, they don't need to make any change. A security officer does not need to make any change. He just wants to view camera. He wants to come and say, I can't be walking up and down. I'm in the front, but I want to see the back view. So I click on back view camera and I'm able to see the back view. I'm able to see inside the office. I'm able to see, maybe I want to be sure the last person walks out. I look at the register and everybody is showing that they've signed out, but I want to be sure that everybody has signed out. Even without physically going into the office and going around, you know, look at the camera, you look at all the points and you can see that all the offices are empty. Or you hear a sound and you want to trace where that sound is, you look at the camera, okay? Or somebody is going in, a plumber is going in to work, and you don't have any of your security officers that can't stand with that plumber. From the camera, you can be watching what the plumber is in. So in, if we wanted to build our table for segregation of duty, security officers will require reader role. Does that make sense now? Okay, yes, yes. Okay, so yeah. these the that's the you need to know what role to assign to each person. Yeah, yeah? terminology okay. is for it. It's segregation segregation of, of duties. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Can I, okay. Okay, supervisor. Supervisor can look, but supervisor should be able to maybe restart a camera. So maybe if um, because most times you will see in every shift there's a supervisor, depending on your on the environment. So a security operator can come and say, ah, sir, camera three is not, you know, displaying or is blur. And when Titi and her team were deploying, they would have told them that one of the ways to resolve blurry cameras is to restart it, right? But remember, you know, when you are restarting a camera, at the moment where the camera is restarting, you are not, you are not capturing anything, Abby. So you need to make sure that whoever can yes. do this is someone that there's a certain level of trust because it means that if I'm compromised, I can claim that this camera was frozen. I tried to restart it. Meanwhile, that interval when I was restarting was when I wanted the people to come into the building. So in every work we do, there's a certain level of trust placed on you. 
when I worked in the banking industry, I had super administrator rights. I could bring down an organization. I could bring down the whole bank, crumple them down. That level of trust was given to me because I had earned it. And by the grace of God, all through my eight years there, I never got compromised, right? But there were certain people that they couldn't give that level of trust. So for those security uh, operators, you can now give them, you know, an elevated, create another level of role for them. So their role will be able to, not only can they view cameras, they can restart camera. And then you now have somebody like the CSO. A CSO should be able to go and see footages. So footages is, it has recorded, it has kept it somewhere. I want to go back to that place where it has kept it and view it. You might not want your security operators to do that because if they go and view it, they can delete it. So you give that level of duty to who? The CSO and to maybe the audit team. So when you have a table like this, this is one of, I'm already giving you expo in one of the projects, because one project, this is, you have to create a segregation of duties table in your, once you have created it, you will now come to your identity provider and now create those roles. And after creating those roles, you will now go to the users and now assign them those roles. So that when I log in and I do my multi-factor authentication, my role will now say, Joy, this is the only thing you can do while logged in because I've been given a role-based access control. Does that make sense now? Yes, thank you. So I was saying that best practice is to always create custom rules. Don't use the default rules that you see there. Reason being that hackers just by default, if I come, if I hack a server, I know that anybody that is inside the group called the default group called administrator has power. So most times in organizations, we don't put people in administrator. We create another group, call it something, but that group has administrator privileges. It's just a way to make it a little bit extra work for a hacker to identify which of this group has that privilege. So you now create custom rule, right? Um, so you can see that the principle of least privilege lets you pick the capabilities that you need because most of those um, default rules have everything. So if you just say virtual administrator, virtual machine administrator, it can mean that if you open that virtual administrator, you will see that the person can delete an admin, restart, restart, sorry, delete the virtual machine, restart the virtual machine, reset the virtual machine. Meanwhile, even though you want to give Joy virtual administrator rights, my during the segregation of duty mapping, the only thing I should do as a virtual administrator is to be able to just restart. I should not be able to delete. But if you just go and give me the default one, I'll have the power to delete. So creating custom rule is best practice in reality. So we have what we call managed identities in cloud. So beyond just your user identity in cloud, as you begin to create different workloads, you have different forms of identity. Some of them are keys, private keys that you use to encrypt traffic between one application and the other. Some of them are secret keys, you know, passwords that you use to create a key chain. Some of them are credentials. You have it that I gave an example, I think it was in day two that um, Franca needs access to a data source that was created. So they give her a credential for that data source, right? Um, that's a credential. You want to you know, manage those kind of you know, identities. And that's where managed identity comes in, where we can manage system identities and user, user identities. And also in managing these identities, we can use role-based access control also to ensure where these identities are um, stored or how they are assessed. So back in on-prem environment, we used to call these things service accounts. So the accounts that 
are used specifically for certain services, but we call them managed identities in the Azure AD. Again, um, during the demo, you'll be able to see how to create a managed identity, which can be user assigned or system assigned. So um, that data source key that was created, when they create that data source key, they can now assign it to to um, Franca's account. So when Franca is trying to connect to the data source, she doesn't necessarily know the password of that identity. But when she wants to connect, because at the Azure identity, we have mapped her to an emanated identity to ask her which of her identities does she want to use. And then she will see that there's a prop for her to use another identity, maybe called um, um, finance DB, something like that. And then she will now select that when she wants to connect to that data source versus using her normal Franca account because a normal Franca account will not have access to that data source. But before, what you will have people do is they will go to the use um, um, Azure IT directory and create an account called um, maybe Finance DB and then share the password with everybody. Now, maybe Franca is the one who got the project. She employed me during the project. During the project, I had a fallout with Franca and I, and I left her company. Is Franca going to take away the password from my head? It's there. So if I'm a bad person or malicious person, I already know the password to their finance DB. But with managed identity, you don't necessarily need to give people the password of an identity. That's what managed identity helps you to, to do. One scenario that we can use is to see application needs to access outside resources like a data, which I've, I've just given this, like a database or storage. A developer needs to do security. You don't want to embed an account or password into the application, right? So what do you do? You use, you know, manage identity so that it would prompt, you know, you and then you will select the identity that you want, okay, based on the role assignment. And then you'll be able to connect there without having to know what the password you know, was. Again, there's a lab for us to try that out. So when we say permission in Active Directory, we're referring to the consent or the authorization for you to be able to perform a specific operation, right? Um, and in Azure Active Directory, there's permissions for each of the operations you are able to do, permissions for what you can view, so are you able to change your settings or are you able to grant or remove settings? Um, and permissions can be assigned directly to a user or to a group. If you remember when we we're talking about groups, I think in day two, we talked about that in a real world as environment where you have 10,000 users, 20,000 users, 5,000 users, you will not typically be assigning certain permissions on a user level, except that user's request is very specific. Most times what you see is that you have grouped people. That's why you see segregation of segregation of duty is a very important activity that you must know how to do as an identity and access manager. You must understand what are people supposed to do. You must know how to map out that segregation of duty. Because once you can do it, then you can group them. You can say, okay, Joy, Titi, do the same thing. So instead of going manually and giving the permission to Joy, or giving it to TT, I can create a group and put them inside and give the permission to the group. So that even if TT tomorrow is moved away from that department and moved, and as long as we remove TT from that group, all those permissions leave her. Versus if I put it directly on TT's account, if TT leaves that department because it is on her account, she moves and she will still carry that permission with her and that elevated right. So best practice also is to try to, to group users or group um, roles, group permissions, rather than assign it um, individually. So this is just talking about some of the default permissions you have on member user and guest user. Who can remember who is a member user and is a guest user? Who can remind us the difference? I will help you. I think it was in day one. So a member user is a staff that you have created on that user. So that person will have, if my domain is joinlimited.com, that person will have franca.ibuzo at joinlimited.com because she's a member, she's a staff. But 
TT is a contractor. She's our CCTV contractor, but we want her to have an identity. We wanted her to be able to connect to the environment and do whatever she wanted to do. And when she's done, we revoke it. So we create TT with her ttlayer.yusuf maybe at Gmail or ttlayer.yusuf at TT Investment Limited. We create her on our identity provider, create a group for her, create those permissions so that she can still use her own identity, right? But TT will appear as a guest because she's not carrying our member identity. So it's also very important that you look at setting permissions. So guest users also have the ability to invite other guest users. So these are some of the settings that we disable, you know, once you set up a tenant because you don't want guest users inviting other guest users. We want to have control over who is the guest user that comes in. So some of these default settings, we remove them in real life scenarios when we're setting up a tenant. So this is different permissions that happen by default and the changes we make. Any questions so far? All right. We also have what we call the Azure Key Vault. Okay. The Azure Key Vault is a vault where we store keys and credentials, especially those generic ones, those manage identities, those secret keys, those identities that are not me specific. So I have my identity, joy at um, joylimited.com. That's my identity, right? However, if there's a managed identity I'm using to connect to um, the firewall, for instance, or to connect from the firewall to the SIM solution, that I, I identity is stored in the key vault, right? And so, we want to make sure that, oh, if everybody in the identity team needs to go to the key vault to get that credential, we want to know who went when, because that identity is not owned by somebody. It's a generic identity, but we want to be able to know who is going here to assess it and who used it. So key vaults, you can grant access to key vaults using role-based access again. So it goes back to that thing I'm talking about, segregation of duty. If a team comes and says, we want to, have service accounts and manage identities, right? The recommendation would be, oh, we'll store them in the key vault. Then you now create the segregation of duty to say, who needs access to this key vault? And what kind of access do they need to this key vault? And what are the kind of things can they do, okay, on the key vault, okay? Is it, it would they be requiring the access to the key vault as themselves? or would they be requiring access to the key vault as an application? So again, we always recommend to assign access policy to groups where possible rather than individual users, just so that when users move across, you don't have to, you will not remember. <laughs> In January, they told you to grant joy access to key vault. You went and this is on my profile. And by June, I've been moved to another department, but now I still have access to the key vault. If my account is compromised and used, I will claim and say, I've moved team. I didn't know, it's not my job to tell people to remove your access, right? But if you use group, the moment somebody has moved, because the person is in department A and I've moved to department B, the moment you remove that person, because an email will go and say, this person is no more in this department uh, to identity. Identity thing will go to every group that is assigned. They are removed the person and automatically all those access rights leave that person's profile. Again, we also have the built-in key vault rules. I would recommend, again, do not just assign people into this game, duplicate these key vaults and customize it to your segregation of duty table that you have built. Make sure that because these default key, key vault rules have all these permissions. So you want to be able to make sure that if I'm making somebody a key vault administrator, the segregation of duty says that the person should be able to do all of this. If that's not what it says, then there's no need to get, put the person inside here. Customize it, remove whatever, and put the ones that the person is supposed to do. Azure Key Vault, again, to just reiterate, is a secure tool for storing secret key certificates. And once these items have been stored, 
right? They can be used by users or an application to perform an action. And so you can retrieve them either using your key vault user interface, or you can retrie retrieve them using a scripting or coding, right? If you are using scripting or coding for those that are coding, it's just to put connection strings to your application. Okay, go ahead, Franca. Okay, the roles are being assigned, yeah? Um, can somebody have like two roles? Can you assign somebody um, a role in the RBAC, the same and a different role in the we using the key vault. Absolutely. Okay, so somebody can have like two the roles. Azure, I can be the Azure, yeah, the Azure role function is different from the key vault function. Yeah. Or okay, are, yeah. Or are, you, or are you asking, can I be inside key vault crypto officer and still be inside key vault reader? Is that what you're saying? Okay, no, what I'm asking is, can I be a key vault administrator and also be um, a, a contributor? The, you know, using the RBAC role to assign me as a contributor, then also so using the... So don't get, all of them are RBAC. This, this whole thing here is RBAC. This is a role-based access control. The same thing with this one. RBAC means role based access control. It's not a type. Okay. It's the same thing with here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you have um, different roles. Yeah. You can use the RBAC to uh, assign people like the owner, contributor. Yes. Yeah. So that's your and... question. It's your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's your question that is your question saying, can I be in contributor? Yeah. And be in user access. Or is your question, can I be in contributor under Azure role? And then mm -hmm. under key vault, can I be in crypto officer? Yes, that's that, that's my question. Yes. Absolutely, because in segregation of duty, there are two different functions. The Azure role function is for totally different things. The Azure role function is to be able to help you manage Azure. Azure resources, while the key vault function is to be able to help you manage your key vault. There are two different things. Okay, okay, managing, okay, like the, the credentials is different. Yeah, okay, exactly. and resources is different, okay. Exactly, Azure resources talks about the Azure tenant, the, the, the virtual, uh, machines. virtual machines, Azure resources, the identity provider, all of these things Azure resources. The key vault is very specific to the vault system, the Azure key vault that is used to secure credentials, secure um, service accounts, secure manage identity, secure storage vaults. So that's why I said that people should, you must always do your segregation of duty table that I am in the storage team does not necessarily mean I need access to the storage vault. It could be that the only thing I do in the storage team is to check the storage server to make sure that things are backing up. Then you focus on giving me Azure rules. But if my, in the segregation of duty, while I am doing backup, I am also the person who, when people need to connect the application to a data source, I'm the one who has to create the identity and make sure that those data sources are connecting then I need access to the vault that has that data source, that data source key. Then you will now give me an additional role by putting me in a role that has access to that vault. So everything starts by understanding people's duties so that you can know what roles to assign them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Like I said, there are different ways you can use the script and code. You can go through the UI to retrieve votes. Um, on a high level, just look at Microsoft has introduced something that they call the Microsoft Entra permissions now. It's something that helps us to do access review because over time, what we found out as identity and access administrators is, like I said, if you, 
in large organizations, you have different people giving different access. And what normally happens is that when there's a compromise, you're now finding out that the compromise happened because another user had you know, more than they're required. So Microsoft has introduced the Microsoft Entra that allows us to do access reviews now. You can maybe create custom policies that says that, you know, when somebody is added into global administrator account, we want to know, and then maybe every three months, pop up people who are added into the global administrator account, you know, pop up people who are added into the key vault, you know, the database key vault. Let's know how many people have access to this key vault. So the Entra permissions um, is a Microsoft tool that just came out. I think it came out last year, so if I'm not mistaken, but we're using it now, you know, to do, this um, governance, we call it more of identity governance. So it can help you discover. So you can see it can help you to discover permission risk, the gap between permissions granted and permissions used, and then can help you to remediate and monitor. So you can find out that Joy has been giving access to security administrator, but she has never done anything beyond viewing. So that can be a proof to say, Joy doesn't need security administrator, give us security reader because we have done in the last one year, every three months when we review, Joy doesn't do anything beyond just viewing the dashboard. But they said, ah, because she's in the security team, give her the same rights that Franca has. You see, you hear people say that thing, give her every right that Franca has, but she has never used it. But if, and if her account is compromised tomorrow, because <coughs> she's not even using it, it will be seen as a normal thing like, oh, She's in security administrator, so she can view. Meanwhile, it's the hacker that is using her account. So it helps us to be able to discover permissions, the gaps, evaluate that, oh, you've been given this permission, you know, you've been granted this permission, but are you even using it? That's one of the value that um, and, um, Microsoft Entra brings to us, you know, and we're studying and using it in recent times to add value to organizations. Okay. That brings us to the end of today. Any questions? Okay, these labs, are they part of the labs that were? Yes, it's that inside that got. Yes, okay. they're all there. I think uh, I get to understand it better because I've did it. Uh, I have done it in uh, Amazon, and they call it a key management service. Absolutely, you're right. So <laughs> I'm getting it better because I've done that. Yes, it's the same thing. So key vault management in Azure is the same thing as key management services management. In, in, in Amazon in AWS. Yeah. Okay, so how are we doing with our labs? Yeah, we have issues, some issues. <laughs> okay, so before we go into the lab, um if you're just joining us again, this is Textiler's cohort 4.0 um, version of Textiler's learning program that happens every year. This is the security learning part, and we've been looking at identity and asset management. This is day five. Please do well to go to our YouTube channel and check for day one to day five. Do all your labs and join the community so that we can help you develop this skill set. My name is Joy M. Medom, and in the absence of any question, thank you for joining us today. All right.